Hello, and welcome to Real Talk with Roberta's House. My name is Tracy Turner, and I am the program manager for the Hope Project here at Roberta's House and your new host for Real Talk with Roberta's House. Today, we are joined by Mr. Christopher Wills, co-facilitator for Roberta's House's MODE support group, which means Men of Loyalty and Dignity. Please help me in joining Mr. Wills to our set today. Hello, sir. Hello, how you doing? I am well, sir. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you for having me. It is an honor. Great. So before we get started, I would like to learn a little more about you and your story. Hmm. And when I say story, I mean what brought you to Roberta's house. And then we'll get into um, the mode support group. Um, well, I came to Roberta's house um, due to having an extensive grief journey, um, starting in 2016 with my mom and then both of my grandmothers. Um, there have been more since then. Um, it is currently 17 altogether, and they're all core persons. So it's not like fourth and fifth cousins. The, my mom, my dad, my grandmothers. Um, men who were brothers, even though it wasn't by lineage, but um, blood wouldn't have made them any less or any more of my brothers. Um, and so it was suggested through therapy um, that I needed to find a space where I could be supported in uh, being a man and having to embrace and go through the grief journey uh, productively and proactively. And that's when I came to uh, Roberta's house. Um, I came uh, in 2021. Um, so my first session was actually still under the pandemic code. So we all met you know, on Zoom. Um, it wasn't until the next session that they actually opened up the building and we could uh, then come in person and do the sessions. And so, yeah, that that's what started the journey of me coming to Roberta's house. Wow. For starters, my deepest condolences for all of the losses that you've experienced. Thank you. How did your grief show up in a way that led you to therapy? Um, <laughs> I, I let my wife have it one day, mm. and I don't do that. Okay. Um, I, I, when my mom... Because my mom, she passed in July of 2016. Um, she had pancreatic and brain cancer. The next month, her mom had pancreatic and brain cancer. So that started the spiral. Mm -hmm. um, and then a couple of months after that, my other grandmother fell down a flight of steps. And she never recovered from her injuries. Mm -hmm. And so from 2016 up until about 2019, I was just dealing, you know, um, I couldn't, I didn't really have time to process it. And I figured that, you know, just staying busy, I would be okay. You know, I had my day job during the week, I DJ on the weekend, so I'm, I'm moving, you know, and I'm just, I'm coming home and just dealing with it when I had to. Um, needless to say, in hindsight, that wasn't necessarily the best, uh, the best protocol or way to deal with it. And, and I just remember um, I was having a conversation with my wife because now there are certain triggers that I didn't have before. So if I'm calling you to like ask you a question or like, hey, I'm here, do you want something? And I'm calling you and you don't answer. And then I call back because I'm thinking you may be trying to get to the phone. But if I call and you're not answering now, that's a trigger because now that's somebody else that I'm close to that that's not picking up the phone. So my mind is immediately going to the, the most negative thought mm -hmm. I can because I'm experiencing that now. And uh, she came home that day and I went up one side of her and down the other just because she didn't pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. And I literally saw the look in her face when I did it because she she wasn't worthy of that. She didn't deserve that. It, she, could she have? Yeah, but it's not that deep. Mm -hmm. And for me to, we've never been in a situation where I've made a mountain out of a molehill. Mm -hmm. And so for me to do that and then to see the hurt on her face from it, because we both know that she didn't deserve that. I was like, yeah, I need some help. 
and that was when uh, the search for a therapist um, took place. I was able to find a therapist that I was comfortable with, mm -hmm. and I began that process. And then she was like, yeah, you need to be around some other people who can uh, empathize mm -hmm. with what it is that you're dealing with. And that's when I filled out the application here, and, and the rest is the present. Okay. So it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, like the therapy helped you identify um, the triggers that may have been associated with feelings of abandonment, fear of, you know, the unknown the, yeah, the yeah. loss. Therapy helped me identify who I am mm -hmm. in the here and now as I'm traveling down a grief journey. Got it. And what I learned in therapy was is that to a certain extent, I never knew who I was. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain functionalities there are certain things that my brain did that was different i i, I who knew that you, your emotions had intelligence i didn't i just thought i was weird mm -hmm. because i saw things differently mm -hmm. i could process something without getting mad about it mm -hmm. i'll get mad later but right now i need to fix this right so being able to compartmentalize things and do i just thought i was different and weird and so it made sense that i was an introvert and i kind of stayed to myself i didn't know that that was no you have emotional intelligence so you have the ability to do these things whereas most people don't that's why you see things differently i, I didn't know that mm -hmm. You know, but at the end of the day, I also didn't go to school mm -hmm. to know how my brain functions. Mm -hmm. I, I also didn't get a degree where I, I learned emotional capacity and mental capacities and things of that nature. My therapist did. So in the midst of helping me with the grief that I'm experiencing, she's basically revealing to me, no, Chris, this is who you are. Mm -hmm. And this is why these triggers and this trauma the fact that you didn't deal with the, the childhood experiences that you had with your mom and dad. Mm -hmm. Because you are this person and your brain works this way, your mind works this way, your heart moves this way, this is why you're dealing with this situation in the manner that you're dealing with it. So now we have to tweak some things so that you can deal with your grief in a manner that is going to fully benefit you as you deal with the processes and as you address the triggers and the traumas and things of that nature. So that's the benefit of therapy. A, a lot of we, we know who we see in the mirror, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we know who we are. Right. And, and, and it's hard for us because you don't have the skill set. Right. A therapist does. Right. Therapy isn't to identify you're crazy. It's to aid in your healing. Because we're all fragmented in some way, shape, or form. Right. So. Right. So moving into the space where you are coming into mold and you're being around men that have similar experiences, mm -hmm. how did you show up as that newly identified version of yourself? I don't trust none of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bunch of men. Like, like, I, I, look, we, we want to be honest, right? right? So, you, so you know, like I said, our first session was on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So you go on and it's like these boxes mm -hmm. and there's men there. And so now they're asking you to be honest and transparent about some of your deepest, darkest, most hurtful moments, you know, and, and to share about people who you love that you've now lost mm -hmm in front of other men that ain't normal <laughs> and and i just met y'all right you know i i've always had trust issues mm -hmm. I, I don't trust people as far as i could throw them <laughs> and now i'm in in a group with a bunch of guys mm -hmm. and they're like yeah chris so how does that make you feel mm. excuse me right um can y'all cut y'all cameras off <laughs> Um, can they leave? Can we go in a breakout room? Right. I don't mind telling you, like, one-on-one, -on -one, but, like, it's grown men mm -hmm. in, in this thing. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, but then you start to listen. Mm -hmm. And now you're hearing these grown men share their experiences. Mm -hmm. And then the facilitator is sharing his experience. And everyone's chiming in. And then you find out, oh, wow, I thought I was the only one that felt like that. Mm -hmm. I thought I was the only one dealing with that issue. Oh, you do that too? 
So then as that's happening, it's like chipping away at this wall because now you realize that, yeah, contrary to what society would have you think, like we're human too and, and we have to learn how to deal with this thing. So when I first walked in, I was guarded as as a lot of guys do and as as we're taught to be. But then you realize that you have more common ground than you have differences. And a lot of things that are taboo Mm -hmm. um, for men to do, you know, a lot of us are either either we're not doing it or we're doing it behind closed doors Mm -hmm. and not telling anyone. Um, And so but with that, you a brotherhood is automatically forged because you literally are trusting that man and, and you establish the rules like what happens here stays here. So you're trusting that man to leave that session and not go telling your business to all their people. And and you feel comfortable in that trust. And that doesn't happen a lot in in today's society. It's hard to trust people. So it was it was a it was an interesting experience at the beginning, but you know, once you start seeing it for what it really is, that's when you start tapping in. And that's when the processes and the things that are discussed in the sessions, that's when they start having a deeper meaning and a better effect. Now you're now those things are becoming easily applicable mm-hmm. because you trust the process and the people in it. What do you think that resistance to emotional vulnerability is rooted in? Like, what do you think that comes from? I know the societal norms and our conditionings um, in our, you know, hum, uh, home environments in our community yeah. has this thing where it is men are supposed to put up a brave face and not yeah. showing emotion and all that. But did you think, do you think that it's a little deeper than that? Did you discover a, a, a different foundation of where that or root of where that came from in your therapy before going well, to support? Well, you learn a little bit in therapy because, you know, according to the, the because there are stigmas and 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 automatic thoughts when you say you're going to therapy. Mm-hmm. So there's a component of that that you kind of get over and going to therapy because, you know, we automatically associate if you're going to therapy, you must be crazy. Mm-hmm. Something got to be wrong with you in a negative connotation mm-hmm. um, because something's wrong with all of us. Mm-hmm. It's just that my wrong, <laughs> what's wrong with me, just looks a little, it's a different hue mm-hmm. from what's wrong with someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, the the thing with the resistance with Roberta's house is we as men are in no way, and specifically black men, we are in no way, shape, or form taught, raised, or even um, in the slightest way do we consider our emotional awareness. Everything, you know, men don't cry. You know, all the stereotypical cliches, men don't cry. Tough man up. Mm-hmm. You know, what you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, you start to win. What's wrong with you? Like being emotionally expressive is now a hindrance. And now you're looked at as less than. And you learn that from a child. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. Like all the old school phrases. That's right. when you're three, four, five. So then you become 12, 13, 14, and now you're going through all these emotional changes. Mm -hmm. And as a young man growing into manhood, there are outlets that are immediately denied to you because if you uh, tap into those outlets, you're not a man or you're less than or or you're 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 questionable. You know, now now people have their own assumptions and things of that nature like that rabbit hole is vicious. And then you become an adult and now you're just conditioned. So even though you you grow, you mature, you get better at things, you learn lessons, you know, you're you're, you're moving forward. That's your foundation. So you don't know anything else. So you haven't even considered the fact that, hey, maybe somebody got it wrong, because when you look outside, everybody else is saying the same thing. And so coming to that realization that, nah, we we have tear ducts just like everybody else, and they're functional for a reason, just like everyone else's. And, and it's not less than, it actually takes strength for a man with all of the weight of the judgment and perceptions and views. It takes strength to be uh, devoted to yourself 
and to make sure that your 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 mental uh, health, your 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 spiritual wellness, your physical health, to make sure that those things are your priority, regardless of what someone else says. It takes strength to go against the world. You know, it's it's not a weakness. Like, and if you don't believe me, stand in the middle of shoppers and cry. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people will cop out. I ain't doing this. No, no, it takes a level of strength to do that, to to put it for the world to see or for people to see, knowing what they're going to think. But at the end of the day, what people see as weakness, you gain strength, you you gain encouragement, you you gain a a, a family. Because trust and believe there's other people who know about it. They're just not showing it to everyone, but you had the bravery to do it in public. Um, you, you now strengthen relationships because if you have a, a brother or a sister or you have a spouse that is aware, that is emotionally aware of themselves, you've now strengthened your relationship because now they're so happy that you've tapped into that component of you because now you're going to grow and that's going to help the relationship to grow. That person may have been apprehensive to come to you about certain things because they know that you're emotionally inept. You're, you're, you're reserved. So why would they bring certain things to you knowing that you're not going to be able to contribute to that conversation in a manner that's beneficial to both of you? Now that you're doing that, now they see a door opening. So now they're going to feel comfortable bringing things to you or at least testing the waters. So relationships are now going to strengthen. You're now going to grow and in and, and the same bridge that you thought you should have burned. Now you're going to repair because you see why you wanted to burn that bridge. And it wasn't a healthy reason. Mm-hmm. It was void of emotion. It was void of compassion. It was void of forgiveness. It was void of mercy. Mm-hmm. And now being emotionally aware, you can tap into that. So, so those are the, the benefits to it. But a lot of times it's hard to get past that initial thing. If, if, if I cry or if I get soft, the world will look at me different. And, 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 it, and it's not as easy. It's easier said than done. It's not an easy step to make. And it takes the support of a group where you see a collective of people who have tapped into that energy to make you feel a little bit more comfortable bit by bit to, to, to try it out, see how it works. And then once you get, get there and you, you, you get that energy and the goodness of it, like able to, just being able to take that first deep breath mm-hmm. and it and it, and just that that moment after that breath where you just feel this release and all that stuff that was stuck in you and, and trapped and building up and are you about to implode if you haven't already or having a couple of times that that release that outlet that that feeling alone is enough to be like yeah I want more of this was it that feeling that made you want to transition from just being a participant into being a co-facilitator of the mobile support group? Nah. <laughs> I, 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 I was, uh, that was one of the arguments me and my therapist had. Okay. Because I'm, I'm not a, I, I, I'm, I, I prefer the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Put me behind the curtain. <laughs> Let me work. <laughs> Y'all don't need to know who I am. Y'all don't need to know what I'm doing. Just know that it's getting done. <laughs> the, the benefit will happen. The, the, the mission will be successful. But y'all don't need to know who. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a spotlight or front person. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, blessings don't need to be advertised. Right. You know, right. they just need to be executed. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've never been a person. I don't want the acclimates or the acknowledgement and all that stuff. So when it was suggested that I transition from a member Mm -hmm. to a facilitator, I was like, "Mm -mm, nope, I'm good. I think, uh, yeah, you you normally know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, but on this one, you know, (laughs) it was his law of averages. It was bound to happen (laughs) that you was going to get one wrong. (laughs) It was just a matter of time. And here it is. Right. Um, One, because I, I I was still in what I felt was my healing. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm still trying to get my my thing together. I'm still trying to get my head on right. I'm still trying to figure this out. Like, it's a lot to manage and process and navigate, especially when it's multiple. 
you know, and, and in a fairly short period of time, mm-hmm. my threes like happen like like the story of Job. Mm-hmm. You know, one messenger's coming with one message, and before they could finish their message, the next message like those that was my experience with it. Mm-hmm. And I'm still trying to just I'm I'm just trying to stabilize myself. And I'm like I'm I'm not even stable and you want me to pour into other people? Like it it there were a couple of reasons why the math wasn't mathing for me. Okay. Um but but she was like, trust me, at this point of where you are, this is what you need mm-hmm. because you have a story that needs to be shared and people in their healing process tend to gravitate or it's more beneficial to hear from a person who has lived it Mm -hmm. versus a person who may have just read it or heard about it. Um, And she was like, and and in that, in you serving, your healing will continue to take place. Now, I wasn't a fan. I mean, it made sense. You it know, sounded good, right? It, it sounded good on paper, but I still <laughs> I still wasn't trying to hear that. But I was like, you know, I, a lot of times I got to go through the emotional mm-hmm. process of like, no, oh! kicking and screaming. And then when it calms down, yeah, you were right. Okay, I'll, I'll sign up. Okay. I, don't, I don't know when, but I'll sign up. But I, I signed up for the uh, program that they had here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I did the program. And, um, what program? So there's a volunteer training program okay. um, that they do here at Roberta's house mm-hmm. to make sure that you have all the information and so that you understand the the process here because there's a way to serve and you have to be conscious and aware of like trigger words mm-hmm. and how you approach you know certain scenarios mm-hmm. because you have to understand and respect the fact that they are in their grief, whatever level it is. They're grieving. Mm-hmm. And so anything that you do as a facilitator, you should be aiding to the healing in that grief process. You don't want to be a catalyst to now you've, you've opened up another wound or things of that nature. And just understanding the psychology and, and, and the mission of Roberta's house and things of that nature. So there's a program that you go through if you want to be a volunteer where that information is disseminated so that when you go into a session, whatever session it may be, you're pretty much fully equipped Mm -hmm. to contribute as a facilitator to the process that's going to take place. So did the volunteer training increase your self-confidence to take you off of that, that side of the, the seesaw rather that was, questioning whether or not you I'll say that I'm going to do it I don't know when I'm going to do it but once you had the training that that make you feel more confident that I can go into this rather sooner than later no no you were still, <laughs> you were still on the no, so so information is two different things mm-hmm. so yes I felt better mm-hmm. because now I I was more aligned right with the mission mm-hmm. and the purpose that Roberta had, Roberta's house has mm-hmm. as it pertains to the different groups and aiding someone in their grief journey. Right. So I, I, I was more confident in having the information, right. but it's just not my nature to get in front of people and, and just like, Hey, here's me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I was a, I'm I'm a recovering addict of this thing called outside validation mm-hmm. because my self esteem was lacking, mm-hmm. and that was the majority of my life. So mm-hmm. even though I'm past that stage, uh, there's still you know life is circular. Mm-hmm. So there are still moments when I, I regress or, or go back to certain phases, and I don't let it get too bad. Mm-hmm. But I still have those moments, and a lot of times, you know, in a front of a group of people, I'm like. Who is me? You know, I'm I'm trying to do this just like you. So who am I? And then I have to be still and listen to that other voice. Like, <laughs> let me tell you who you are. Right, right. And then once I hear that one, it's kind of like that, okay, not my will, but your will be done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> like I had it right up until that point. I was good that I had to hear that voice and he had to speak reasonably. Darn him. Uh, (laughs) I have just a couple final questions for you, Mr. Wills. First, how can men be encouraged to seek 
help and open up about their emotions as it's related to grief or any type of emotional support? Who? Um, well, the easiest way, or what I'll say is, um, the 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 men who have had to have to lead by example, because what ends up happening is it's not you can say whatever you want to uh, another guy, you can say all the positive things, all the quotables and things of that nature, but it's them seeing you uh, walk that walk, um, seeing you be vulnerable and transparent and upfront and honest, being emotionally aware of where you are and governing yourself accordingly. You know, you having conversations with them like, hey, man, we had a great session last night at, at Roberta's house. I hope you come. Just the fact that you have you keep going to be able to tell them that you're going, you know, them, you know, actions speak louder than words. So that is the best way to do it. Because no matter what you say, if they don't see you engaged in the very behavior that you want them to engage in, your words really don't have that much validity. Mm -hmm. So lead by example. Show them so that they see what it looks like. And, and, and they'll see your growth as you go. And they'll see your change. They'll watch you go from somebody who really don't talk about it. And the next time y'all having a conversation and randomly you start talking about how you miss this person, but how you feel better because if Roberta's house has shown me how to do this, this and this. And I've been doing these processes and now I feel better, man. I'm sorry I, I cut you off um, when my wife passed and that, you know, you were trying to call me and I wasn't answering the call. But this is why. But now I was helped to see that that's not necessarily the best thing. So I hope we can work on repairing our friendship, man, because I miss you, bro. I miss our conversations. I want us to get back together and do some things there. That, that's action. Why? That's that's a change in a pattern of behavior, which is going to speak volumes way more than anything you could say to them. Right. And yeah. it and it create space for more authentic mm -hmm. connections with others. Yes. Okay. And my final question is, can you share a personal story of loss and grief and how it has helped you turn that pain into purpose? Who? Hey, you that, saved that, that one, huh? Know, okay. That's a big one, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why it's last. <laughs> Boo and hiss. Okay. <laughs> We just got finished talking about, okay, all right. Um, so my mom, um, who passed in 2016, the backstory behind that is um, due to religious reasons. Um, three years prior to her passing, her and my dad had cut me off. So there was no communication. I sent letters. They were returned. I left voicemail messages no phone calls, even when there were a couple of times I saw them out in public and they were not able to communicate to me in any way, shape or form due to their religious choices. Okay. All right. So then that happened three years later. I then get a call from my brother. It was, it was 4th of July. I had just finished DJing an event. He called me. He was like, hey, mom's in the hospital and she's not doing good. I said, well, do me a favor. And let those religious persons that are going to be there tomorrow, let them know I'm not asking for permission. I'm going to be there tomorrow. And that day began the last week and a half that she was here on this earth. But I was there every day. That last day, um, because she had had a small stroke, but they were able to revive her and everything. And then there was the discussion of the, you can't do that anymore. If anything happens to her, she doesn't want to come back. All right, so now we're taking that in. So my mom, who is awake, but her speech is slurred, mm -hmm. you know, and she can barely talk. And after three years of not being able to talk to my mom and dad, it was me, my wife, my brother, my father, and my mother, and we're all holding hands, and she's praying. Can barely talk, but she's praying for all of us to be okay. She's after the prayer, she's then reciting her favorite scriptures. Yeah. Again, still can't talk. I literally watched my mom transition from her physical form to her spiritual transition. And the reason why that 
is pain to purpose is because that is now the greatest example of faith that I've ever seen. Because even though I don't agree with the religion, she was faithful enough to her God because when Jesus said, I didn't come here to judge, I came to separate. Mm -hmm. And never he he said it did he never said who was off or on the exemption list. Right. right. So for my mom to be faithful enough in that moment to feel as though in order for her to remain faithful, we have to sever this tie, mm -hmm. even though you're my son. Mm -hmm. That is the greatest example of faith to this day for me. And I now pattern my purpose and my faith in that purpose off of what I saw happen that day. So now when I, I come to Roberta, Roberta's house and, and, and I'm, I'm talking to the fellas in the mold meetings, now when I agreed after, the, you know, <laughs> being forcefully moved into volunteering to be a facilitator. But now when I'm moving in that capacity, mm -hmm. that, that, that pain that we're talking about, it fuels the purpose because if I hadn't have gone through that, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here in a member capacity. And then I wouldn't have the, the fire and the purpose to then move from member to co-facilitator. So that that would be uh, one of the more prevalent examples of how that turned into something that even in her physical absence, mm -hmm. her spiritual presence continues to move me and guide me and direct me. And it is an example of of the God she chose to follow and I follow as well. Okay. That was beautiful. I have so many more questions, so we're going to have to have you back. Yeah, well, um, but we are out of time now so I want to thank you one for being receptive or being self-aware first of all to know that in that moment when you were reading your wife her rights um, that something was wrong and you needed to, to get realigned with who you are um, so thank you for that thank you for being receptive to therapy thank you for being receptive to healing your grief and loss and thank you for heeding or accepting the call to be a co-facilitator and lead by example here at Roberta's house and in the mold group we appreciate you so very much and for our audience I want you all to please check out our website which is robertashouse.org and all of our social media platforms which is Roberta's house md Thank you so very much for joining us. And Mr. Wills, if you would join me in saying our Roberta's House mantra, which is... I, I care, care for you, you, you care, care for me, me and we, we care, care for, for each, each other. other. Thank you so very much for your time. See you all next time. Mm -hmm.